Does money feel broken to you? Because it sure does to me. This is a good friend of mine, Yanis, who I visited just last year in Cyprus. We live in a world today, we talk fairly often, and we live in a world today where I can take out my phone from my pocket right now, open up Skype, and get into a real-time video chat with him. But I still can't pay him the $15 that I owe him for my share of the tab from our last meet. This is really frustrating. We live in a world today where we've seen amazing technological progress just in the last few years. So why does it feel like our money is still stuck way back in the 20th century? Now, to answer this, we need to look at our story of money and how we've gotten to where we are today. So what, what are you seeing here? These are three different types of tokens. Because for much of our history, the way that we've done money is through token-based systems. And here's what a transaction looks like in these systems. It's instant, peer-to-peer, -peer, free, frictionless. You see, in a token-based system, money transfers directly from person to person. And the tokens, the specific tokens that we've used throughout our history depends on how we've structured our societies and what the prevailing technologies of the day are. And so we saw tokens like shells, like gold, and like paper money. But in the last evolution of our society, in the last century, when we saw a move from our physical world, when our society expanded into the virtual world, we saw a shift where our communications and our trade moved to within our networks. And we didn't see a token to correspond with that shift. Instead, what we saw was an entire shift of our system from a token-based system to an identity-based system. And here's what a transaction looks like in that system. It's hardly frictionless. You see, in an identity-based system, we've placed control of our funds with entrusted third parties. And the way we do transactions is by sending along credentials, little bits of our identity, to these third parties to convince them to do transactions on our behalf. Now, this worked and it solved some of our immediate challenges with that last transition, but there were some shortcomings with this new system. Shortcomings that we're starting to see now as we get deeper into our age of technological progress. The first is that transactions in the system are very manual processes. They can sometimes be costly, and they can take days to get where they're going when we're trying to send transactions. Now, the thing with these transactions, too, is that it's problematic to do simple things. If you want to try to accept a payment online in most countries in the world, that is a difficult thing to do. Sometimes it's because of a simple thing, like the right third parties not quite lining up. Now, these systems also have a bit of a problem with security, because when we do a transaction in the system, the way that that transaction works is that we send along the keys to our funds, to these third parties, and we have to hope that these keys aren't compromised, because if they are, anybody who holds those keys holds access to our funds. This is the basis of things like credit card fraud, like ATM tampering, like identity theft. And as we get further into, into the system, we're starting to see the cracks. We're seeing things like hacks, of major companies. We're seeing things like hacks of central banks, like the $80 million hack of the Bangladeshi Central Bank just last year. We're seeing a lot of friction in our money, and we're seeing these, start up, these sort of flaws starting to pop up. And what it is we're seeing is a real need to get back to a token-based way of doing money. We're seeing the need for a digital token for increasingly digital times. Now, a digital token system is something that has been elusive to technologists and computer scientists for much of the past few decades. Elusive, that is, until October 2008, when this white paper was published to an obscure corner of the internet by an anonymous group of persons. In it was described a system, it was the details of a system that allowed us to do digital tokens across an open network to store and send these tokens. That system is what we know today as Bitcoin. Now, what is Bitcoin? If you've heard of it, you may think of it as digital currency or just internet money, but it is so much more than that. It is a system that underlies the entire new field of technology that we know today as blockchain technology. 
It represents an entirely new way of doing money, and it has the potential to change a lot of the problems that we see today. Now, this is all well and good, but what makes a system special? What makes a system different? Well, here's three things about it that sets it apart from anything that we see today. The first is that it's decentralized. Bitcoin is owned by no company, no institution, and no bank. The way it was created and the way it is maintained today is through the efforts of thousands of persons around the world who contribute their time and their skills to its upkeep. These persons are governed by powerful consensus mechanisms that is built into the code. And what that simply means is that for changes to happen to the system, everybody must agree. Now, what we end up with is a very strong form of democracy that runs this entire system. The second thing is that Bitcoin is secure. And saying it's secure is an understatement. You see, it's one of the most secure systems that we've seen to date. The way that it works is Bitcoin is secured by the rules of math, and that is enforced by the processing power of persons who contribute their processing time from around the world. Now, this might sound a bit complicated, but for perspective, let's take the example of Google, a company we all know today. Google is one of the biggest and most powerful companies that we see in the world. If Google were to take all its servers, the things that run things like Google Search, like YouTube, like Gmail, if they were to take all those servers and point them at securing the Bitcoin network, they would make up their processing power would make up less than 1% of the capacity that secures that network today. That's the kind of security we're talking about. Bitcoin is also programmable. Its digital tokens can be linked to instructions and be made smart. Money, we're seeing the merging of money and software, where money just sort of shrinks into the background. We're able to bake our money directly into products, services, and apps so that Money just works, and you don't have to think about it. Now, this is, this is all well and good, but what are people using this new technology for? What are people using these digital tokens for? Well, let's take the fact that Bitcoin is borderless. People are taking that aspect of it and applying it to the remittances industry, an industry that is made up of cross-border payments. Now, it's crazy when you think about it, the idea of a cross-border payment. You never hear anybody asking about how to send a cross-border email. Now, the remittances industry sees flows of $400 billion a year through it, often from migrants back to their home countries, countries that are often developing countries. Those persons have to pass their funds through services that take anywhere between 8 and 20% in fees. That is $32 billion a year in fees levied against some of the most vulnerable people on our planet. What we're seeing is persons taking this sort of technology and revolutionizing the space by bringing costs right down, by cutting transfer times, and by placing power back into the hands of these people who are sending these funds. Now, the money aspects of it are all fine, but it's important to remember that it's the digital token system that's the real innovation here. And we're seeing people doing some very interesting things with those digital tokens. We're seeing people creating entirely new asset classes, digital asset classes. They're doing things like putting company shares or real estate titles on the blockchain. That gives assets like these the benefits of this technology, benefits like ease of transferability, high security, and transparency. We're also seeing people take that programmable nature that programmable aspect of this technology, and doing things like creating smart contracts, which are simple contracts that are governed by code instead of just the law. Now, this is all exciting and interesting stuff, but for me, we haven't even gotten to what's the most exciting aspect of this technology as yet. Because technologies like these, democratizing technologies, they give us the opportunity to change how we see innovation happening in the world, to change the narrative of where progress comes from. Because we live in a world today where the means of production, things that control who gets to create things in the world, have largely been democratized. Things like access to capital, resources, talent, and knowledge. For perspective, let's look at a company like Amazon. Amazon 
in the late 90s when it was started would have taken millions of dollars, an army of employees, and months just to put together the basic infrastructure to make that work. Today, that can realistically be done with a few thousand dollars, a handful of engineers, and maybe a few days to get the right pieces together. That's where we are right now. We've gotten to the point where innovation has been made accessible and where we have technologies that are in search of problems. And in this world, where's progress going to come from if this is the reality we're looking at? Now, I put forward that where we're going to see progress are those places with the richest problem sets, places like our countries in the global south. The things that we once thought of as our disadvantages would then become our advantages, our unique advantages in the world. It gives us the opportunity to take our problems, create solutions for them, and then push those solutions back out to the rest of the world. And what does this look like? How, what are some examples of how this might work? Well, let's take, for example, the country Ghana and a company called Bitland. Bitland is working on solving the problem of corruption in the land registry space. It's a very abstract problem, but they have a team that's made up of persons from Europe, US, the US, and from Ghana. And if they wanted to, they could have based that company, that startup, in any one of the innovation hubs anywhere in the US or the Europe, anywhere in the global north. But instead, they chose to base that company in Ghana because they take any bet that if I am able to solve that problem of corruption in that particular space, if I solve that in the US or in Europe, it's not really that big a deal. But if I can solve it in Ghana, that is a problem that many other countries are going to be looking for that solution for. It's something that is going to be in far higher demand. What they've done is they've taken something that was once a problem for Ghana, let's say the high corruption per capita ratio, and they've turned it into an advantage. And what about us here in the Caribbean? Now, when I think about the Caribbean, I think about statistics like these. That is a high level of diversity. And designing systems for that kind of diversity is a tough job, especially financial systems. What if we could design systems that embraces this diversity instead of that, uh, systems that shy away from it? What if we can design a system where each individual country, each territory, can retain the things that make it unique, can retain their currencies and the way that they do things, but on that system, they can all interact and interrupt, interoperate seamlessly. Now, what would that look like? If you've ever tried to send a transaction today, let's say, from Trinidad to Jamaica, you know the pain of that. You know the pain of like, trying to figure out which bank do I use, how many currency hops do I need to go through, how much is it going to cost? When is it going to get there? Is it even going to get there? We know these pains if we've tried it. Now, imagine being able to just send a, a transaction from Trinidad to a country like Cuba or Haiti, and it just gets there. It's taken that problem that, was, that we perceived as something that was a disadvantage and flipping it into an advantage, or high diversity per capita ratio. Now, there's a company called Bit in Barbados that's doing just this. And if they're successful, you can bet your bottom dollar that as a solution, that is going to be useful for us, but that the rest of the world is going to be interested in and going to want to take a look at. It's an example of the global south pushing things back out to the global north. Now, how can we get involved in this innovative potential? How can we get involved in this whole wave of things that we're seeing coming at us? Now, when I think about this question, what I think of is this quote. It's a quote that says that the next big thing, the big thing of tomorrow, often looks like a toy today. Because this is a story of how disruptive innovation happens. It often happens by getting our hands on the technology, getting our hands dirty, experimenting, playing, baking it into our little projects and, and services, and figuring out what we can do with it. And to be sure, there will be hiccups as they are with any new technology. I mean, in the early days of the internet, most people misunderstood it, and the popular opinion was that it was a den for criminals and pornographers only, not for decent folks like us. But today, we see the internet has evolved into a significant part of our daily lives. And so, 
we get back to that question of how can we get involved with this today? Now, what I just put up there was a QR code. It's a private key to an address where I put about $100 worth of Bitcoin. Let's try a little experiment. If any of you wanted to, when this video comes out, you can get any one of the Bitcoin apps in any, in any of the Play Stores or App Stores. You can scan that QR code and sweep those funds into your own address. And yes, it is a race, so whoever gets it first gets it. Now, think about what I've done there. From this stage, I've been able to send a transaction through the internet, through a YouTube video, into the future to an anonymous person who might be in this hall or might be sitting anywhere else in the world. That is changing how we think about what money is and what we can do with money. Now, it's important to also remember that we're still in the very early stages of this technology. People often make the comparison that where we are with this technology is similar to where we were with the internet in 1995. And much like Sir Tim Berners-Lee, one of the founding fathers of the internet, much like he was sitting at his computer sometime in the early 90s, staring at a blank screen much like this one, about to type the commands that would flip the switch on one of the most innovative periods that we've seen in our recent history. Much like him, we're sitting here staring at our own blank screens with the tools and technologies available to us to change our own narratives, to rewrite our own bits of reality. And given this, there's really only one question that matters. What will we create? Thank you. <laughs>